Welcome to the regular meeting of the Public Health and Safety Committee for January 19th, 2022. I'm Latricia Vita and I'm the chair of this committee. As we begin, I will note that for the record, this meeting has remote participation by members of the city council and city staff as authorized under Minnesota statutes section 13D.021 due to the declared local public health emergency. The city will be recording and posting this meeting to the city's website and the YouTube channel as a means of increasing public access and transparency. This meeting is public and is subject to the Minnesota open meeting laws. At this time, I will ask the clerk to please call the roll so we can verify quorum for this meeting. Council member Wansley Warlaba. Present. Council member Rainville. Present. Council member Ellison. Council member Palmasano. Present. Vice Chair Payne. Present. Council member Ellison. And Chair Vita. Present. There are five members present. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. With that, the agenda for today's meeting is before us. There are 11 items on today's consent agenda, and I will read through. First, we have uh, number one is the Minnesota Department of Health grant for vaccination incentive program uh, 2021-01168. Number two, the Minnesota Department of Health Workforce Development Grant, that's 2022-00045. Third, contract with Minneapolis Safety Initiative for Neighborhood Patrol Services, 2022-00046. Number four, the grant application to the Bloomberg Philanthropies for BioChair Project, 2022-00048. Number five, Minnesota Department of Health Public Health Service Grant for Essential Public Health Services, 2022-0050. Number six, the National Association of County and City Officials Grant for Lead Poisoning Prevention Strategies, 2022-00052. Number seven, Health Department Master Contract with Parents and Community Action, Inc., 2022-00053. Number eight, amendment to school-based clinic agreement with special school district number one, Minneapolis schools, 2022-00054. Number nine, contracts with Century College and Hennepin Technical College for police cadet training, 2022-00047. Number 10, a contract amendment with League of Minnesota Cities Insurance Trust for patrol, a peace officer accredited training online subscription, 2022-00049. And number 11, the U.S. Department of Justice grant to implement a comprehensive program to respond to opioid abuse. And that is 2022-00051. Is there any discussions on these items? can't really see. Chair Vita, this is Vice Chair Payne. I had a question on item number three, contract with the Minneapolis Safety Initiative. Um, I have understanding that this is a pass-through contract for community patrols, but I was wondering if anyone could speak to um, what the Minneapolis Safety Initiative is. Is that a, a community organization or some other type of legal entity that is initiating the contract? I think we have Crystal Vandenberg on the um, in the meeting today who could possibly answer that question. Um, Madam Chair, this is Robin McPherson of the police department and actually uh, Inspector Katie Blackwell is on the call as okay. well and so she may want to answer this but <clears throat> briefly it is an organization of the neighborhood areas including some of the businesses it is a legal entity um, we can't contract with a non-legal entity or, or uh, uh, just an organization that has no standing so it is a legal entity 
Thank you, Robin. And Inspector Blackwell, if you have any additional um, information that you can share with Vice Chair Payne, that'd be helpful. Sure, Madam Madam Chair. Uh, so I guess Robin talked a lot about it, but um, it's a buyback program specifically for residents or businesses in the specific areas if they choose um, to have the additional safety initiatives such as extra patrols and things of that nature. And then if I could just ask a clarifying question. Um, the We know that we have some staffing constraints within the department. How do those um, dynamics play with how these contracts are executed? That's a great question, Vice Chair Payne. Um, so staffing issues are absolute, you know, we're working on them. <clears throat> so buyback is for officers that are off duty. So when they're they might have the day off or they might work an extension of their shift. So these buyback are generally set hours, four to five hours generally. And so officers choose to, to work them on their off duty time. And we we have buyback throughout the city in different parts. And if we don't fill them, then uh, we just don't fill them. And the neighborhood is, is aware of that through the, we communicate that when we're talking about buyback. If you don't mind, if I'd, I'd like to add just a couple of comments on that, please. Um, the the buyback is is strictly voluntary, so officers do not have to sign up for any buyback. So we often do go without people who sign up for it. So we have uh, unused hours, basically. Uh, in our contract, we do not guarantee that those hours will be filled. And then just to, to uh, speak a little bit more to that, 911 response is the primary responsibility. So if there, if we're short, let's say on the street for a staffing and we can't fill it uh, with overtime slots or assistance from other precincts, the first thing we do is pull from the buyback. So the community members are the, the buyback program, whatever community or business uh, that are doing the buyback are that's really communicated to. Thank you. So does that answer your questions, Vice Chair Payne? It does. Thank you. Council member uh, Wansley Wardlebaugh. Thank you, Chair, um, Patricia. Um, just had a couple of follow up questions to one that council member uh, Payne raised, um, one being the process um, of how community groups can go about accessing this. Um, you know, for instance, if I had a neighborhood in, in War II that wanted to know how to participate in this, like what is the decision maker process, you know, that's overseeing this process. Just love to hear a little bit more about how, you know, residents can access these funds or this program, just a little bit more about that. Well, that's a great question, council member. So generally when I go to a community meetings or uh, business meetings, the community or neighborhood association or the business association, will request that from a precinct commander and out of the five precincts. And then that starts the process with the, the contract with Director McPherson and her team. And basically the contract, they lay out different language on what the community wants or what the businesses want and how much they're extra they're willing to pay or how long they want it for. Um, so that contract usually goes a year. And uh, Director McPherson, if you had anything more to add to that, Thank you. I guess the only thing I would add is that this does have to go through the inspector for their approval, as well as the assistant chief is also, or the chief is normally approving these as well. Just another follow-up question. Um, would love to know how this program has been um, supportive in reducing crime citywide. You know, I, I'm always as someone who's done research around this area and understanding that there's credible sources out there that talked about, you know, the correlation between beat cops, increased presence on the streets, and then reducing, you know, crime citywide. Like, would love to hear how this has been, this initiative has been supportive of those goals. And I know that's a goal of the city. Great question, council members. So there's a pretty strong correlation when we my, myself as a precinct uh, inspector, when we look at crime statistics, and generally what we see is that when we see high crime areas, uh, we throw a director patrol or buyback in those areas. And what we see is it tends to crime will decrease significantly. Um, and so that's where we, we will fully analyze like where the high crime areas are, pattern, looking for patterns, and then put that director patrol in that neighborhood. So it's a great question. I hope I answered 
Good question, Council Member. Any further questions? I would also like to add that uh, Council Member Ellison joined in um, and would like to be recognized as present in this meeting. Um, uh, yes, Council Member Ellison here. Uh, please mark me down as present and uh, dismiss the roll call, but have been present for the conversation. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Um, any further discussion? With no further discussion, I'll move for approval of items one through 11 and ask that the clerk take uh, the, call, the roll call. Council member Wansley Warlaba. Oh, sorry, I think I definitely missed her. There was a couple other items that I, I know I sent the email to council uh, chair, uh, Latricia, I mean, Vita, as well as uh, vice chair um, Kane last night about the additional items that I wanted to pull for question. Okay, sorry, I missed that. Yeah. So do you have additional questions? Yes, I would like to pull for question um, items, uh, just for everyone to know, items four, nine, and 10. Okay. Is that okay? Four, yes, items okay. four, nine, and 10. Yes. So in relationship to item number four, um, if there's a staff member present to just give kind of a overview of what the biochar, um, you know, initiative is and how that relates to the city's climate action goals. Uh, Madam Chair, this is Jim Doton from the uh, Minneapolis Health Department Environmental Services. Uh, I've been running the biochar program for about eight years now as an initiative. And what this is, is a program where we um, basically uh, take carbon that's been uh, saved or frozen from trees essentially and uh, uses that as a uh, soil amendment in things like uh, urban gar or urban agriculture, forestry, urban forestry, uh, transportation corridors, etc. But uh, it's a carbon negative technology, so it's actually trying to reverse or draw down uh, climate change. And it's, so that's how it relates to uh, the city's carbon footprint. It is actually a neg carbon negative component. So it goes backwards and as a project or in, in, in itself, uh, we anticipate that this will actually be a revenue neutral project because of the value of the uh, carbon that would be produced as part of this project. And uh, it also addresses the emerald ash borer waste problem that we have not only in Minneapolis, but in the area. And so we have substantial support from this from the state and uh, read, uh, other counties and the areas in other cities as well as looking at this as, as supporting uh, the, the climate fight within Minneapolis. So it's neg but, but it is a carbon negative uh, instead of just a carbon neutral component uh, to help us meet our climate action goals. And it is uh, actually one of the items specified in the 2040 uh, plan. Thank you so much, Jim, for providing that overview. Um, I have no other questions on that item. I'm ready to move to item number nine, if that's okay with the committee and chair. Yes, and thank you. Um, I think Robin, um, I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think, yeah, Robin McPherson, not council member Warlobar, can answer the uh, question item number nine and 10 both. <laughs> Yes, Madam Chair, if there's a specific question and also uh, Lieutenant Fisher of our training department is here as well. And we probably can answer the questions in total because they're both for similar items. But please, if you have specific questions. Yes, um, in regard to item number nine, I just wanted to say that, you know, I'm really excited about this partnership, knowing that, you know, the college model from my understanding and work that I've done in this area is definitely better than the academy model. Um, and I'm glad that our public safety training is happening in colleges and not academies. Um, and Hennepin Tech has 
has been offering trainings for our officers or officers in general for a long time. Um, but also the, the fact stands that, um, you know, Officer Derek Chauvin and Tao both involved with George Floyd's murder, um, both went through their program. Um, and I know the, the Hennepin uh, Tech has also promised a major overhaul of their training practices. And I, as you know, a representative of the city, I would love to see the city be a partner in making sure that that overhaul happens um, and making sure that, you know, that overhaul, it definitely um, centers eliminating, you know, militaristic practices, racially biased policing uh, measures from that training. So some of the key questions that I had has been, has there been any analysis of this overhaul, like where Hennepin Tech or even um, Century College are currently in um, and really, you know, changing and transforming um, the, the programming that they're offering to um, those seeking to become law enforcers? Uh, I can answer that a little bit, uh, Council Member. Uh, I worked with uh, Hennepin Technical College to uh, set up this um, current class that is going through uh, of cadets. And I do know that with um, post obviously changing some of their uh, things that they are going to be requesting from obviously uh, officers across the state and then as well as the um, training institutions, uh, the professional police officer education programs, uh, that there are some things that Hennepin Technical College uh, is adding uh, to addition to their uh, training, uh, trying to keep up with what um, POST is requesting uh, with those changes. So I do know that there are some changes uh, with their program moving forward. Awesome. Um, just a couple more questions. Um, do you happen to know if they're also working with community, especially those that are either survivors of uh, police violence or brutality and making some of those changing changes to their curriculum? Uh, I do not know the answer to that specific question. Uh, that is definitely something I can reach out to them and uh, get back to you um, with an answer on that specific question. And also some of the metrics, like what metrics are in place. I know you mentioned you're in that process and that's great that um, there's going to be that active presence on the behalf of the city to monitor this. Um, but do they have some metrics in place and kind of a timeline where they're hoping to execute this overhaul? <laughs> Um, as far as some of the changes, I know those changes have already moved forward that will actually be in place with our students going through um, that, their program currently right now. Um, but again, with the specific question you just asked prior to this one, that one I unfortunately don't have an answer to at this exact moment, but happy to get that for you. And last question on this one, kind of what will your role, again, wanting to make sure that we have representation in this process, kind of what will your role be in also helping make some of those changes as well as they're going through this overhauling process of their curriculum? Uh, well, we're not technically in charge of necessarily everything that's going on um, in the, on the school side of that. Um, again, with the post board coming up with some some different changes. Um, they have a little bit more control um, over those things moving forward. As far as our um, staff, we make sure that we're following through um, with our students while they're out at school. So it's not as if they're just completely on their own. Um, they do know that they're representing the city of Minneapolis. Uh, they're wearing that uniform and they are you know, expected uh, to follow all of our policies and fall in line with um, every that, everything that a city of Minneapolis employee um, does. Um, but then we will be taking that information from post board as well and making changes that we can um, throughout our police academy to make sure that we are um, providing the best training uh, when they end up coming back to MPD. Thank you so much, uh, Fisher, for answering those questions and um, committee chair Vita. That's basically the, the questions I have for item number nine. Um, if committee members are Okay, with that, I'm ready to move to item number 10. Please do, Council Member Wallenbaugh. Awesome. Um, so some of the questions, it's kind of the, the same dynamic. Um, I recognize as a city, we have the opportunity to leverage our role as a vendor, as a contractor to, you know, basically demand the highest quality of service. Um, and, and thinking of this, kind of some of the similar questions I know you know, from my backgrounds, you know, uh, with the teachers union, the role that continuing education plays and making sure that we're ensuring that quality across the board for all of our, you know, public personnel. So have some questions also, 
how will patrol be working with or has been working with the community, um, especially those that's involved or have been impacted by police uh, violence to, um, you know, co-craft some of their, you know, continuing education uh, materials. Um, but patrol online um, and Robin, uh, Director McPherson, you can step in here too if you have uh, any further information here. Um, but patrol online does an absolutely fantastic job. I would actually um, suggest and I would be more than happy to actually go through some of that material with you. Um, they're usually one hour training sessions that our officers do. They can do them there. It's at a computer. So the plus of that training is they can actually do that while they're at work. If they get a call, they can pause that training. They can go and actually respond to the police call and then come back to doing um, that training. Um, but all of the information that comes from Patrol Online um, is all post-certified um, information. It really is some fantastic um, information. They obviously do a lot of um, uh, looking into um, this type of stuff that you're looking for, what has gone on in the community, leaning into giving specific examples um, from certain case law, like this just happened in the city of Golden Valley, and this is what the case was, and this is what happened, and this is why per the legal standings of how things work. Um, so they give very specific examples, mostly um, from the actual state of Minnesota. So it really helps officers make that connection uh, with what the law is, with, with what standards are, and what we're looking for for behavior um, as we're moving forward. Um, so I would be happy to walk through any of that stuff with you. I think you would actually be fairly impressed uh, with the, the teaching that is conducted with Control Online. Oh, sorry. Council Member Payne, did you also have a question? I was going to jump in and say I'd be interested in having that walk through as well. Yeah, I think we should definitely do it. I think you, um, I think you guys would all be um, pretty, ha pretty happy with it. And actually, that kind of relates to. Sorry, I know I'm going backwards. You'll be here, um, but <laughs> if there's a way to even also do a walk through, I don't. I know COVID, COVID protocols, like we're being intentional about that. But even being able to do, I don't know if this has been done in the past, like a council field trip to like a session at Hennepin. Um, tech or Century College just to see for ourselves, you know, the type of um, curriculum that's being offered. Like, I love shadow days, so I think that's a really great opportunity and really appreciate you extending the opportunity to also go through some of these materials with us who are interested. So thank you, Officer Fisher. Oh, absolutely. Um, more than happy to do that. I don't believe that we have, uh, at least not when I have been in the training unit, uh, had any council members go out um, specifically to the schools to watch any of the training. I could be wrong about that, but from my experience, um, I would be happy to set that up if uh, people would be interested um, to do that and um, set that up with the college and go out there with you as well um, and any of the patrol online. So let's um, let's definitely schedule that if you're interested. Yes, thank you so much. And I'm glad uh, Council Member Payne is one of the tag team and of course hope other <laughs> council members would join. We can have a whole uh school but well a school bus probably is to say right now but we'll we'll find one. <laughs> any further discussion any further discussion seeing none i'll move approval of items one through eleven and ask the clerk to please call the roll Councilmember Wansley Warlaba. Uh, aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Aye. Vice Chair Payne. Aye. And Chair Vita. Aye. There are six ayes. That carries and the consent agenda is approved. Uh, seeing no further business before us and without objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you all.